Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Musser Group in Wayne, Pennsylvania. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, Shannon Lane, New York Knight Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Ethan Milrod, go to. And uh, we'd like to introduce our guest, Pete Musser, who is the Musser Group. What, what, what is your title with the Musser Group? You're the CEO of the Musser Group? Yes. The CEO of the Musser Group in Wayne, Pennsylvania. So tell us, uh, Pete, uh, I understand that you've been involved with building over 550 companies, creating over 240,000 jobs. You've been involved with causing 13 fund families to get started, totaling over $12 billion, and you've created over $200 billion in shareholder wealth. So I wanted the public to get a quick sense of who you are. Where where are you from originally? Where did you grow up? Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And how many brothers and sisters? One two-year-old brother. So you have a brother that's two years older. You're the youngest of two. And I understand when you were a kid, something happened about two years old. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? My mother and father got divorced when I was two. Mom and dad got divorced when you were two. And, and, and how do you think that that affected you? What do you think that did to you, you know, mom and dad getting divorced when you were two? Well, it just meant you, you, you looked to your mother at all times because you, there was no father to question or ask questions of. So it, it didn't, didn't seem horrible to me, but maybe I just loved my mother all the much more. So you had a you had a really close relationship with your mom. We had a real close relationship. So as opposed to feeling separate, you really you really felt an intimacy. You really feel safe working with other people. True. That's right. Exactly right. Uh huh. And I'm wondering, how did that? Is that one of the reasons you've been so successful in creating over 550 companies, 240 thousand jobs, 13 funds, et cetera, et cetera? Is because you really enjoy the intimacy of working with people. Yes, I enjoyed it and uh, was able to do well at it because I conveyed a trustful image to people. Um, you you have this you know tremendous ability to see the future in terms of which businesses are prone to succeed and which ones m- maybe need a special twist to them. Is your greatest strength your people skills or your ability to see the future? I really think people skills. People skills. What do you mean? Tell me more. Well, I can I can buy the enthusiasm that young entrepreneurs or almost any entrepreneur has for the business they're pursuing. I can buy that enthusiasm as they say it and understand it and be willing to invest in it. So what you're looking for, the common thread is when you've done all these investments, you've been looking for, it's the person you're looking for. Exactly right. That's more important than the specific idea. It truly is. Because when you're starting things and doing new things, you have to understand they won't all work. And that's part of the business. And you have to be willing to take that chance and not be totally swept away when the business doesn't take off. So you're really looking for the character, the individual, the persistence, their ability to pull a team together to work as other members of the team because we know that the market's going to change or the business is going to need to continue to evolve, so it's always based on the people more than the idea. Exactly right. Uh huh. Isn't that one of the val- isn't that one of the benefits, one of the values you brought to the party in terms of not only just being able to identify the people, but also being aware of other opportunities and being able to help these companies with how to evolve their idea. Yes, you have to be you have to be flexible. Maybe we'll be willing to. I can I think of Joe Siegel in uh, QVC. Uh, he was he was talking about a business on, online if you think about it, and he was one of the first to do that. So let's let's talk for a moment about QVC. So QVC was one of the fastest growing businesses in American history, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, 
Only two businesses did a hundred million in their first year going public. QVC was one. Compact Computer was the other. Uh huh. So, um, what was your role in causing QVC to get started? Well, Joe uh, was a friend of mine, and of course, he had done Franklin Mint successfully. And he said to me, I want to start a company uh, just like Safeguard in marketing. And what he meant by that was he would own, uh, he would start a holding company called QVC, and he would own uh, other things in the holding company. So what happened to his idea when he sat down to speak with you about this? Well, I thought it was a great idea because I had done the same thing with Safeguard. I knew Joe to be a great marketing guy, which he truly is, and I was excited to uh, raise raise the first money for him. So, but his original idea about this holding company, it didn't necessarily quite happen. You put a twist to his idea to create QVC, didn't you? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, I mean, the uh, he came to you creating a holding company, but is it? But didn't you put a twist to it and actually say, well, listen, why don't we just create QVC instead? I just put a name on it. Oh, you put a name on it. Yeah. I see. And didn't you introduce him to somebody else to create QVC? No. I, I, I thought uh, wasn't um, you were involved with the early formation of Comcast, if I remember. Well, correctly. yes. And uh, he wanted he wanted uh, ten investors to each put in three hundred thousand dollars for a total of three million, and that's. That's the way he wanted to start the company. And I suggested that we go to Ralph Roberts because we had just invested in Comcast and Ralph. And Ralph was thrilled to be an early investor and ultimately, as you know, kept enlarging to where he he owned control of QVC. Mm-hmm. So it's fair to say that you helped the early formation of QVC, one of the fastest growing companies in the history of the country. That's very fair to say. Uh huh. Um, so I understand that um, you you graduated uh, from Lehigh University, and you had a um, a special roommate back in those days who, who was your room who was your roommate and what what uh, what role did that roommate ev- eventually play in um, this this business called safeguard business systems that roommate was vincent buck bell and uh he was my closest friend for as long as he lived and uh he joined us uh to run uh Safeguard Business Systems, which was one of our subsidiaries. That was in the uh, earlier mid-50s, and Buck passed five or ten years ago? Yes. So you had a relationship with him for 50 years or 60 years or something like that, or 70 years. And it was a great relationship. So you're really into long-term relationships and deep relationships, aren't you? Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, you know, you've created, it's unbelievable you've been involved with causing 550 companies to start, 240,000 jobs, 13 funds, $12 billion invested. It's amazing. And, um, you know, typically in the news you hear that the CEO is a bad person and so on. You're all about relationships, though, aren't you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Who's got the next question here? I just wanted to go back and ask a little about your mom. Can you describe your mom and uh, what you remember most about her? Well, what I remember the most is she was so gracious. Uh, She just was one of the most gracious people you could ever meet, which means everybody liked her. And uh, I like to think that I got her personality. And and how about hard work? I mean, it sounded like your mom, you know, when she got divorced, had to sort of work real hard to to, um, provide for you and your brother. Is that true? That is certainly true. And she was uh, lucky enough to get a job with with the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, And that's where she continued to work as long as she did work. And what what did that mean to you to, like, see your mom working so hard? Because I I think you have a hard work ethic considering we're here today and you're working. And I'm just curious, what did that mean to you to watch your mom work so hard? Well, I just took it for granted that that's the way you did things. And... uh, and you're nice about it and 
good about it, and that's that's the way life was to be. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this business spotlight. Want to help building your business with help from the show's CEOs? Our CEOs can help you uncover more opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that. They've succeeded in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars, and some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. The same CEOs you've heard on the show for 10 years may be willing to help you build your business, uncover new opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that, succeeding in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars. And some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Musser Group in Wayne, Pennsylvania. This is your host, Herb Cohen, <laughs> with my co-host, Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Ethan Milrod, go to. And uh, we'd like to introduce our guest, Pete Musser, who is the Musser Group. Pete, you, you, to, you told us a story when you were a young man growing up in Harrisburg about where you got your name from. Because your, your real name is Warren. Yes. Would you mind sharing with the listening audience where that where Pete came from? Well, my real name is Warren Van Dyke Musser, because that was her father's name, Warren Van Dyke. Uh, and the lady next door, and we lived uh, in a row house. The lady next door she started calling me Petey Dink. I hope with affection, and uh, then that abbreviated to Petey. Why'd you, why why did she call you Petey Dink? Where did that name come from? Well, it was a character in the funny papers, and I guess I caused some mischievous things around the, the neighborhood, <laughs> and uh, so that's how it got to be Pete, and it's been Pete ever since. So what was life like for you as a young boy, a young teen growing up in Harrisburg? What were you up to at the time, beyond being mischievous, of course? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, 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 don't, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the life uh, because I was into sports and uh, always tried to engage in sports, never too successfully. I was never a varsity athlete, but I was good enough to play most sports of a little bit. You mean team sports? Yes. Like what? What kind of sports did you play? Well, I tried football and... Uh, Got injured every time I tried. Uh, I played basketball. Uh, was never any good at baseball. What what did the effect being on those teams have on you? Because it sounds like later on in your career, uh, team involvement played a big role in your in your success in the companies that you helped start. Well, that's true. Uh, management is is a team science, and. Uh, I learned how to do that pretty well. I didn't have any training in how to be a manager, but uh, I quickly found out that you had to manage other people if you wanted to have a successful result. And Where did you learn you, that? Where did you learn that? Well, for, for one thing, reading about successful companies, and that's what I always did, try to read about success and emulate it. And you quickly learn that you're only as good as the people that work for you. Mm. And there, there was a highlight of your sports career in college. Can you tell us a little about that when you were in the fraternity? It sounded like your fraternity won a couple uh, <laughs> couple of years. <clears throat> well, at, at Lehigh, uh, all the fraternities entered into a, a, a tournament play. I mean, there might be 15 frater fraternities engaged. And they all would put up a team in baseball and volleyball and swimming and football and multiple multiple sports. 
and uh, you kept track of the cumulative scores, and whoever did the best won the trophy for that year at the school. And I was thrilled that we won it twice. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and what was your role on those teams? I know you're you're pretty humble and say you weren't the best athlete, but um, I, I think you still played an important role. Would you say you did? Were you a leader of those teams, or kind of the glue that held everybody together? I don't know about that. I can think of guys that did a better job at that than I did. But uh, nobody was more enthusiastic than I was. In terms of business, what, what do you do better than the other members on the team? What makes you special? Well, I think one thing is the, is the willingness and the ability to take risk. And when you're in a small business area and willing to sm- start things, you're doing the riskiest thing you can do in business. Mm-hmm. And so being willing to do that is, is a necessary characteristic and I was certainly willing to do that because I would take ideas that I heard and help translate them into business like QVC. Joe, I, I mean, I, I knew Joe Siegel. I knew he had been successful at Franklin Mint, but I didn't know how he would do in this on-the-air on business. Where do you think that came from, that, that ability to handle risk? Some people just can't handle that. So where did that come from? There's only one person it could have come from, and that's my mother. And was she, was she, was she, abil- did she have the ability to handle risk as well, you think? Yes. And how did she demonstrate that? Well, in, uh, you know, in a divorce mode, being alone in life and raising two boys, that's a risk. In working for the state capital and, you know, earning enough money to handle raising two boys that, that's that's what she was able to do and I think you said she never complained either right she never complained and have you carried that characteristic on I hope so I don't complain much but uh, in fact I don't complain what, what good does it do <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would help <laughs> Pete what would you tell someone who is unsure if they have what it takes to start a business well, that, of course, is a great question, and you can't really know whether you can do it or not. You, you, you have to be around businesses that are starting, and not necessarily be the chief risk taker each time. You can be a second or third employee and, and be part of a successful team, and then that makes it ever so much easier for you to be the leader Later, this uh, this fellow by the name of uh, Walter Buckley. Who, who who is Walter Buckley, and when did you meet him, and what did you do to him? Walter Buckley, one of my all time favorites. His uh, grandfather was a man named Morgan, I believe. Uh, was at Dunwoody, the retirement home, over in Newtown Square. And my mother had moved down from Harrisburg and was a resident at Dunwoody. Mm-hmm. And so those two met over there and would have dinner together uh, and talk about their boys, as my mother would say. So uh, Mr. Morgan would talk about Walter. She'd talk about me. And finally, they decided we should meet. All right. And, that, so- and that's how we met. So what what ended up happening? You guys ended up starting a business together. What was the name of that business, and what was uh, spectacular about that business? That business was called Internet Capital. This was in the 90s when Internet was just getting popular in the, the market. And Walter uh, was was with Safeguard as a, a new employee, and he met... Uh, another newcomer named Ken Fox whose father was a director Bob Fox and they decided they wanted to form an internet holding company and he spoke to me about it and he said I hope you don't mind Pete but I'm going to leave Safeguard and uh, uh, Ken and I are going to go into this internet business 
And I said, well, Walter, uh, not only don't I mind, I want to encourage you, and we will put in $13 million to help you get started. So um, <clears throat> that business set some records. What kind of records did that business set? <laughs> well, it certainly did. And I, I wouldn't exactly say they were predictable. Mm-hmm. But it turned out large companies, companies the size of DuPont, people like that, wanted to know more about the Internet, wanted to be in the Internet business, and didn't know how to do it, and were perfectly willing to put up like 10, 20, 30 million into this holding company to be part of the Internet business. And the um, the valuation of that business at one time was better than uh, General Motors, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Mm-hmm. It was this astounding, just astounding. And... Uh, this is another business you started. This just like you caused QVC to happen, Internet Capital Group as well. Diane, uh, we, we were, we're also uh, blessed with sitting with Diane Swigart, who has been um, a right hand of Pete's for how many years now? 46. So you've been, um, so what, what's your official title been with, uh, with uh, Mr. Musser? Um, secretary. Back when I started, there, there really weren't executive assistants. Everyone was a secretary. Oh, so are you calling yourself a secretary nowadays? Are you calling yourself an executive assistant or what? It depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Musser Group in Wayne, Pennsylvania. This is your host, Herb Cohen, <laughs> with my co-host, Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight, Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Ethan Milrod, go to. And uh, we'd like to introduce our guest, Pete Musser, who is the Musser Group. So you guys have been together for 46 years? Yes. Uh-huh. So you've, you've been there and done that. So what, what, what are we missing about Pete? I mean, we're trying to get a sense of his character. We certainly, you know, have a sense of the accomplishments he's had. What, what are we missing here? He is the most generous person you will ever meet. How's that? What do you mean by that, generous? I mean, I understand there's 13 funds he's caused to happen, $12 billion, $200 billion in shareholder wealth. 240,000 jobs. What do you mean he's, he's uh, generous? You don't hear that stuff in the media typically. Just as he was always looking out for the shareholders, that's how he was with the employees. Um, bonus time. Everyone was was just amazed at what they received. And it was all because of Mr. Musser. How about all the community organizations and nonprofits? Did uh, Mr. Musser ever donate to any of those? Oh, my goodness. Mr. Musser has a foundation, the Musser Foundation, and he is constantly giving to, for instance, Lehigh University or Sinus College, which was his uh, first wife's alma mater, um, the Boy Scouts. Gosh, so many. I So many. I see. Uh, has Mr. Musser served on the boards of any of these organizations? Any of these, does he, I understand he's donated time, money. How about time? Has he spent any time with any of these boards? He has in the past. It's it's slowly dwindled down to mm-hmm. not too many, but mm-hmm. he has. Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Musser, why, why did you uh, bother spending time with all these nonprofit organizations? And do you think you were able to make a difference with them? Well, I know I was. Uh with my experience with small business, uh, it was most of these c- companies, like the Boy Scouts, uh, are working with small business to be able to ha- get money for scouting. And uh, out of all that, uh, we have the uh, Musser Island, right? Boy Scouts. Well, oh, the Musser Scout Reservation. Scout, Scout Reservation, which I wouldn't be able to find from here, but it's somewhere <laughs> that way. And uh, 
uh, four sky, four camps are located on this master setting. So you've made quite a number of uh, quite significant donations of both time and money. Is that fair to say? Would you say um, it's tough to keep track of them all? Not well. Yes, it is difficult to keep track of them all. <laughs> why? Why is it? Why, why? Why do you give back? How, and how does that make you feel? Well, it makes you feel wonderful, and uh, yeah, if you, you have to be grateful if you've had success, particularly in the small business area, because the odds are, are tough on small business. But if you've been successful, you want to help other people be successful. Because that's part of the game. Speaking of small businesses, I mean, you could have focused on large enterprises, large major companies to to your as your core focus. What is it about small businesses that made you focus on those instead? Freedom. I would not be good with a large business that would try to tell me how to act in a way I wouldn't want to act that way. I mean, you started out as a small business, right? Oh, yeah. And how, how, how did you get your start? You told us a story earlier on about, you know, how you got your start and where you got your yeah, money for somebody, your first business. Somebody, uh, somebody decided to lend you um, $50,000 very early on when you were getting started. Why, why, did, they, why did they agree to lend you $50,000? Yeah, what did they see in you? Yeah, what did they see in you? Well, it can only be that they thought I could invest that money successfully which would mean a return for them and a return for everybody else. Yeah, but that's probably second to something else that they needed to see first. Wasn't that their, wasn't it your character that they were interested in first? Isn't that well, what I you think th- they're making that decision when they decide to put the money in. They're, they're d- judging your character. So what do you think they saw in your character that they approved of or that they wanted to be involved with? Well, honesty, ambition... They actually saw a skill set that they felt could could make small business work, and then they they could make some money out of it. Mm-hmm. I, you mentioned that you know a lot of small business fail, sort of risky business. Yeah, I'm just curious, like what is it that makes a small business successful? What is it that you look at that you say, you know, this is going to work this time? What what do you see? Well. It, it, if, if it's a service business, and most of ours have been service businesses, you have to see them be in a position to sell something to the customer the customer wants to buy. And of course, that's what Joe, Joe Siegel saw in QVC. Uh, but you have to be willing to service customers or, or you won't succeed. Right, and you're saying that, are you saying customer service after you sell the product is important as well? Quite. Yeah, yeah, customer satisfaction. Customer. customer satisfaction is the end game. And is there is, was there any particular small business that really excited you in your time? Like that you were you really got excited when you worked with the leadership team? I think most of them. Most, all of them. Most, well, most of them. But for instance, Novell. We started Novell. That turned into a very successful company, and. It was just terribly exciting that we could sell a product uh, that, that Bill Gates wanted to own and twice tried to buy us. And how did you get started with Novell? An individual that uh, we met along the way on the West Coast uh, led us to some people that he had worked with out there. And... Uh, It it was it was the first of its kind. It was the first to supply networking to the small business area. Or are you a technology genius where you see which technologies are going to work, or how are you able to do this with five hundred and fifty companies in all these different industries? I am the last thing from a technology genius. <laughs> how are you able to do it then? Yes, Diane. Mister Musser does not even have a computer. And he just about knows how to use a cell phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, where, so, where this? How this ability to bet on the right companies? Where did this come from? How do you do that? You got to be very lucky. I don't know that it's <laughs> lucky. You seem to have a track record here. You got to be very lucky, and you got to be willing to find people 
that are experts and bring them in because you do need the expertise. And if you don't have it, you better find somebody that does. You have to be more than a little bit lucky when you're investing in startup companies. There's just no way to foresee what's going to happen to you. In terms of people, how young were you when this impressive instinct began to show? Right about when I got out of Lehigh, so I guess I was, what's that, late teens? Were you always careful how you picked your friends, which friends you hung out with? Yes, but not with the thought that I'd be doing business with all of them. But you understood who people were. You understood their nature. I hope so. And, of course, when you meet a guy like Buck Bell, and you have, it's e- easy to, to judge a guy like that because he's, he's, he's so obviously honest and bright and smart. So you need a little help. So you have an incredible intuitive instinct, don't you? Did that come from Mom? I think I think any, any good trade I have came from Mom. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, wasn't there a question about the puppy that's on the floor here? What, what was that? Oh yeah, Pete. We have a special guest here today. Can you tell us? Can you tell our listening audience who G- Gibbons is? Higgins. 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 Yeah, who's Higgins? Higgins is my golden retriever at the present time, and I guess over the last what twenty, thirty years, I've always had a golden, right, Don? Yes. And since I had my own business, I could take him to work. <laughs> And I always have. And I think it's been a great business asset because when people come to visit us for the first time and they meet a golden retriever, they always have a smile. And uh, it's heartwarming to have golden retrievers around the office. They've always always been on your board, huh? Yeah. (laughs) And we've had some times where we invite prominent people in for a lunch and the dog gets in there before they do. We've had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this business spotlight. One help building your business with help from this show's CEOs. Our CEOs can help you uncover more opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that. They've succeeded in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars, and some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. The same CEOs you've heard on the show for 10 years may be willing to help you build your business, uncover new opportunities, grow your sales, connect you, help you raise money, all the big issues, because our CEOs have been there and done that, succeeding in creating millions of jobs and earning millions of dollars. And some are available to advise you. Now, email mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. That's mentors at executiveleadersradio.com. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Musser Group in Wayne, Pennsylvania. This is your host, Herb Cohen, <laughs> with my co-host, Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Ethan Milrod, go to. And uh, we'd like to introduce our guest, Pete Musser, who is the Musser Group. I think Pete Musser, it's, it's pretty clear that he should be. He is credited for creating the Silicon Valley of Philadelphia yeah. because of the funds he started, the number of businesses he started, the technology businesses he started, the jobs he's provided, the funds. The opportunities that he's created for other people to do to follow in his footsteps. It's very fair. And, you know, even though he's been very involved in giving back, usually it's, you know, to the different universities and the organizations around town, he's not usually credited with with causing the Philadelphia Silicon Valley to form, which he has. There's also a couple of, um, there's a, there was a, the largest uh, semi-governmental uh, seed stage organization uh, is, a, is an organization called Ben Franklin, which has been around for uh, many years, 30, 35 years now. Didn't you have uh, some special relationship in helping cause that organization to build? In fact, I remember uh, when I would visit Ben Franklin, they had your picture on the wall. Why? Early you... on, I helped them to grow. Good friends of mine still work there. and mm-hmm. this we, was... we helped another group called the uh, Tech Council, and uh, we well, were you very didn't help active. Them. You, you helped form that organization, didn't you? Yeah. 
And uh, then it's had uh, a ripple effect in terms of other organizations. So a lot of the stuff you've done, you may have done, and then it created other opportunities as well. There's a ripple effect from it. Pete, throughout this interview, I just keep thinking about how humble you are. Who taught you to be humble like this? <laughs> Nobody had to teach me. It's a, a, uh, I have an inner confidence, put it that way. But uh, I've made plenty of mistakes, too. <laughs> And so I, I know I know each time you make a decision, you're being judged. Why is it important to be humble in business? Well, when the adverse things do happen, if you're a little more comfortable than if you got out there too confidently and made statements that turn out not to be true. Plus, I've always been in a position where I'm representing investors. It's never been my money, so-called. It's investor money. And uh, we started a practice called the rights offering. I'm, sure you know about that, but that's one of the unique things I think we've done. I, I don't think of another company that has done rights offerings the way we did. And we did it as a way to allow the shareholders to buy stocks at a low price. But you just said every time you make a decision, you're being judged. What's that mean to you? Everything. You know, everything. You, you want to be right for yourself, but you want to be, more often you want to be right for the other people. So do you think about that every time you make a decision? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We at one point had 100,000 investors uh, in, in, as shareholders in Safeguard. Wow. 100,000 investors. You really, you really shouldered that responsibility. You took that seriously, didn't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh-huh. Wow. I enjoyed the benefits of it, too, you know, because that's 100,000 people pulling for you and being willing to put up money. You were an investor in Nutrisystems, is that correct? Oh, yes. That took place right in this room here where Herb is sitting. That's where, uh, what's his name, De Piano was sitting. And Mike Hagan was right there where Diane is. And Mike needed $9 million to buy control of Nutrisystems. Mike had decided to put in $3 million out of the nine, which is a big chunk. And uh, he was starting to have a timid reaction, you know. Is this too much to put in? Mm -hmm. Because it probably was too much to put in. He was putting in a third of the money needed. And I was trying to hold him in position because I thought it was a wonderful idea on his part and he should be rewarded accordingly. Turned out, on the cover of Forbes, it was the smartest venture decision of the year for anybody. Stock went to seventy dollars. So this is another example, like QVC, like Novell, like Comcast, where you hit the ball out of the park. You were involved with hitting the ball out of the park again. Nutra was formed by that guy that owned the uh, 76ers for a while. Mm -hmm. Katz. Mr. Katz. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, Hagen, had, he, he didn't have any experience in the food business. But he understood another way to cause the distribution to occur to create the revenue. Yes. Mm -hmm. The internet. Uh-huh, the Internet. <laughs> Diane, what, what are we missing about uh, Mr. Musser? I mean, you guys have worked together for 46 years. Well, I can remember uh, many of the girls at Safeguard saying to me that whenever Mr. Musser walked down the hall, he made sure to say hello to everyone. You could be, you could be coming in at night to clean the office, and he would say hello to you. And you could be his best friend, and he would treat you exactly the same way. That's just... Mr. Musser. What did that mean to you and to the girls? Oh, my gosh. We always thought we, we worked in a place like Disney World because everybody loved working at Safeguard under Mr. Musser. They loved it. Hardly anyone ever left Safeguard. And there were always tons of people who wished they had worked there. Mm. He, is, he is just a giving, caring, honest, wonderful person. Let me ask you a question. If you wanted to retire now, could you? If I wanted to? Yeah. Yes. Why don't you? Because I'm with him to the end. Why is that? Because I love him. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man. And I sometimes feel like he's my father. Other times I feel like he's my son. I have to take care of him. <laughs> yeah, I saw you correcting him earlier. It's like you guys have a real give and take kind of relationship. He's been trying to get me to say that for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Nutrisystem, constantly. He always says Nutrisystem. He can call it what he wants. 
But I'm so, thinking in this interview, he should be the right age. Pete, what did you see in Diane when Diane... What, so 46 years, that was in 1970, you know. Well, she was fresh out of high school, right? Yes, I was. Mm-hmm. You, you clearly had the instinct to recognize something in her like you have with so many other people in your life. She's not hard to recognize. I mean, she's bright, pleasant, attractive. So, yeah, but uh, I wasn't the first guy at Safeguard you worked with, right? Right. I worked in the accounting department. And twice Mr. Musser was losing his assistance because of um, their husbands being transferred. And both assistants asked me if I wanted to work for him. And I was, oh, my gosh, no. I was just so nervous even thinking about it. But the second time, my husband said to me, you might not get a third chance at this. You Maybe you should give it a try. So I was told that I was going to be one of many to be interviewed. And the day I had my interview with Mr. Musser, he acted like I had the job. Everything he was saying to me was just so confusing to me because he acted like I had the job. But I'm thinking, well, he has all these other people he has to interview. And I just came right out and I said, do you mean I have the job? And he said, yeah. And I I was just shocked. So I I remember years ago uh, visiting Mr. Musser and Mr. Musser didn't have one administrative assistant. Hmm. Did he? What was the story about Mr. Musser's administrative assistants, and why did he need more than one? And what was your role in that whole thing? We did everything for Mr. Musser, personally, you know, business-wise, and it just took more than one person. But but you wanted to do everything that that you could do for him. You know, you just didn't want to stop at the things you knew you had to do. You just wanted to, like, wax his desk or, you know, just things that weren't expected of you but you just wanted to do for him yeah like the number of the quantity of people that were coming in the door the really important people where they needed to be greeted correctly or somebody needed to be taken to dinner or somebody needed this or somebody wanted that you guys just handled it all didn't you yes yes but we wanted to because we loved mr musser so it's really a personal relationship that's developed it's not just the dollars I with, guess I guess the dollars had to be there, but that's not the, what the real key was, is it? With me, definitely. What do you mean? I, I, I remember one story I, I really like the best. Okay. We had a, a, a black lady working for us. Oh, yes. Remember that? Yes. And she needed a refrigerator. She came in to work one day, and her refrigerator, it was in the summer, and her refrigerator stopped working. And she told her boss, who was, uh, of course, under Mr. Musser, And that story got to Mr. Musser, and he said, go out today and buy her a refrigerator and have it delivered right away. And he paid for it personally. That's how he, that was just one example of what Mr. Musser did for everyone. Well, why, 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 why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? Well, I just couldn't imagine living in this world without a refrigerator. And Mm -hmm. here she was, a lovely lady working for us, and she didn't have a refrigerator, so... You Just thought you'd buy her one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've been speaking <laughs> with... Um, but she's still in our lives. She still stops in here. She of course she does. Oh. So we, we've been speaking with Pete Musser, the Musser Group here on Executive Leaders Radio, and Diane Swigart, who's been Pete's right hand for 46 years. Uh, my name's Herb Cohen with Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight, Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Ethan Milrod, go to. And um, thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to visit themussergroup.com. That's themussergroup.com. And our website's executiveleadersradio.com. You'll learn more about our executive leaders. Thank you for joining us today. By the way, again, Pete Musser has started over 500, caused the start at least 550 companies, let alone the ripple effect. 240,000 jobs, 13 fund families totaling, totaling over $12 billion dollars and over $200 billion in shareholder wealth created. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to visit themustergroup.com and executeleadersradio.com, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.